So, the first European elections. Um, basically, so far, European elections have been characterized in general by second order events, just because they're not important. All right. And uh, in 2014, maybe we're assisting to the first non second uh, order European elections, some kind of first order elections. And let's see. What are, th what are second order elections? There are three major elements to that model. Basically, they're characterized by low turnout. They're characterized by small and new parties that gain a lot of attention and votes. And they're characterized by typically national governments uh, getting punished and uh, uh, losing at the polls. Now, what do we have in terms of evidence? Here we look at uh, turnout among the founding states of the uh, European Union, the blue line up there. And you can see, indeed, there is an erosion of turnout that took place. But this turnout erosion is above all due to the successive uh, um, uh, uh, enlargement rounds of the European Union, as you can see by the new member states' curves down there. What you also can see is that there is a bit of a flattening out towards the end. Between 2004 and 2009, there is not such much, so much of a decline. If you see it here, you see the differences between West and East, and you can see that basically in Eastern Europe, in the new member states, turnout even went up. So the second point was that small parties are winning. Well, uh, that is true. In 2009, there were uh, 168 parties that were elected into the European Parliament, and um, uh, 41 of the 56 big parties um, lost, basically, seats in, and, and votes in these elections. But at the same time, the party groups are strongly limiting this fragmentation. You could imagine a huge uh, number of parties completely unconnected, but the party groups actually limit this by connecting these parties to each other. And if you look at the, at the figures in 79, the four largest groups in the European Parliament has always retained around 80% of all seats in the European Parliament. So basically, quite a lot of stability here. Then on the governing party's losing side. Well, before the last elections, uh, we had 60, sub, uh, 60 governing parties in Europe in 2009. And it's true that 39, two-thirds out of these 60 parties in government actually lost votes. So that is actually pretty much going in the direction of what the second order uh, theory tells us. Um, the governing coalitions uh, lost votes in 23 of the member states. But if you look a little bit closer at the data, you will see that this is not just random. What you could see is quite some politicization going on in these winners and losers statistics. And you could see that above all, it was the center left that was on the losing side and the center right that was actually doing quite well. So in general, we have a politicization of uh, European elections. And uh, you can add to this that we have had in 2009 quite some strong advances uh, by populist uh, and extreme right-wing parties already in 2009. Um, we had uh, uh, the same that went for anti-EU parties that made advances. The Greens advanced, but less, uh, less uh, consist consistently. So my conclusion is that basically the, the first signs of what we're expecting now to happen in these 2014 elections were already visible in 2009. Let's make some forecasts. Uh, this is based on data that has been published uh, by Paul Watch uh, two days ago. Um, and you can see the S&D group uh, is again losing a little bit to the EPP. Um, it would have a little bit less seats than, uh, than the EPP. Alde remains in third place, again slightly before the Greens. In Germany, very importantly, I think there are five new parties that are probably going to make it into the European Parliament, and that is basically due to the Bundesverfassungsgerichts uh, uh, decision of earlier this year, having uh, lowered the threshold famously. So what we will see is probably a generally larger fragmentation, uh, uh, even larger fragmentation, of what we had. However, um, importantly to note here is that the trio at the top between EPP, the Socialists and uh, the ALDE is probably going to lose quite a lot. Um, there are massive advances to be, to be seen of populist, anti-EU, extreme right-wing parties that will make it into the parliament. So, 
uh, if you look at the second order uh, uh, theory again, we would say that on the turnout side, I personally would expect higher turnout. We see a campaign that is much more intensive than has been any campaign so far. Um, and that has been confirmed by, by empirical observation, basically. So maybe it's a bit less second order now with turnout going up. Um, we also saw that uh, small parties will probably make uh, quite a lot of winning. So this is, again, more going in the, in the direction of the second orderness. And governing parties, well, uh, they're probably going to lose again. This trend will probably continue generally across Europe, but maybe not so much because European elections are not important, but maybe because they are important and because they become much more uh, European than they have been before. Maybe we're resisting some kind of Europeanization of European elections. So the big question here is, are the 2014 EP elections not just the first European elections, but are they also the first important elections? And with this, I would like to turn to the panel now. And um, I would like to give the floor first to uh, my former colleague and friend, uh, current, still current friend, Miguel Maduro, who has joined the uh, Portuguese government. And uh, coming from Portugal, Miguel, I would like to know from you, how is the repercussion uh, of, these, uh, of the crisis that has uh, been affecting Portugal, like few other countries, in a very, very hard way, uh, and where we gladly see some kind of uh, 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 recovery on the horizon? What is the impact on uh, the partisan landscape? What is the impact on these European elections, in your view? Listen to me, because... Okay, naturally, as you would expect in times of crisis and in a period where difficult measures had to be implemented and in a period of financial difficulties for many Portuguese, trust on political institutions in general, both national and European, decreases. It's a well-known phenomenon. We know that. And even if we have reversed the expectations of many, even if our adjustment program has been a success, because not only have we been successful in terms of fiscal consolidation, reducing, reducing the budget deficit in 5% of GDP in three years, but we have been able to do that, particularly in the last year, with economic growth and with a decrease and lower unemployment, um, even if that is the case, this success takes time to be visible to people. People that have had their salaries cut, that have had their pensions cut, many of which unemployment has decreased 2.5% in Portugal in one year, but is still way too high, 15.1%. So until you render that visible to people, uh, this naturally affects the trust they have on political institutions, both national and European. And this is what also what creates the risk for populism in Europe in general and for more radical parties to be successful in Europe. I think this also makes even more important for the next European elections to be not only about the, the fact that we have different candidates for president of the commission may be a factor in mobilizing people to vote. I don't think it will be as much as a factor as we might like it to be. It will take time. Even because probably this debate that we will have this afternoon will be transmitted in Italy but not in all member states. Until we make that more salient in all member states, until we make that an important and normal factor in how the campaign will take place, it will be difficult for people to, de to see these different candidates as really the political alternatives in which they, for which, from which they have to choose. Most citizens will still be voting on along national lines and national issues, not European issues, unfortunately. And unfortunately because I think rendering European elections ir truly European is also very important in terms of the political legitimacy of Europe for the future. Uh, we've been saying this in Portugal for some time in government. Um, we believe budgetary discipline is very important in Europe and we believe 
strong rules and the clear enforcement of those rules in the context of the monetary union is important. But we believe that that makes it even more important to also add other dimensions to Europe. Uh, dimensions in terms of coordination of economic policies, stronger budget capacity for the Union, and a stronger political dimension of the Europe. The Union cannot simply be a source of discipline on the member states without having then an additional political legitimacy. And this, if you have an entity that limits very important dimensions of national public policies, you are reducing the margin for political choice at national level. The only way you can legitimate that is if you then offer the margin for that choice, the possibility for that choice at European level. If we don't make possible for citizens to choose among different political programs for Europe, then the only choice we leave to them is to be for or against Europe. And that's why I think it's so important for this to be genuinely European elections. Will I think this will happen this time? Not yet, but at least there are some steps in the right direction. Yes, uh, I think you, you raised a very important point about uh, for or against uh, Europe, a kind of a dichotomous choice that electors are, are maybe facing increasingly. Certainly, this is uh, uh, very high on the agenda in France. Uh, Sylvie Goulard is coming from. You also mentioned, Miguel, the role of uh, uh, the candidates to the Commission presidency now that may uh, increase these, uh, the, the attention given to these uh, elections. Uh, however, in France, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Sylvie Goulard, it's not so much one of these candidates that is having the biggest impact, but it's, it is rather Marine Le Pen. Uh, you told me also that you're kind of uh, tired of not talking about European elections, but more about, uh, about this pro-anti-Europe uh, uh, sentiment that you have in, in, in France. What is your take? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, Actually, I'm tired, and that's the reason why I'm not going to answer your question, if I may. <laughs> um, right. I, I just would like to, to remind you, let's leave a little bit to politics. We are here in a beautiful place, and think in terms of painting. When Caravaggio or Picasso began to, to use its own, style, its own style, what was the reaction of the people around? The people were surprised and very often they have the huge majority of the people being against them. What we are trying to do in Europe right now is to create something new. And of course we are disturbing the people who are still thinking in the category of the past. And I'm sorry, but your presentation was a very conservative traditional. We should begin by explaining that we are in the only supranational democracy in the world and that requires maybe more efforts when we fought than we fought before. The second point is that, and we wrote it in the book we wrote together with Marie Monte uh, two years ago, uh, the national democracy is not in a very good shape. In France, for example, we had a very low turnout in the, reg in the local elections last month for the first time. And in many countries, you have also part of the political class being criticized and considered uh, not connected to the people. Then my third point, um, well, we have put as many obstacles as possible in order to make sure that the citizens do not appreciate what we do. We are working at the European Parliament in the dark. I mean, on, on the French TV, at least, for example, you never, ever have uh, an idea of what is happening in the European Parliament. We have introduced a new treaty. I mean, the new treaty entered into force since 2009, and no one, at least in my country, made a campaign. The, in France, usually the, the minister in charge of uh, home affairs is in charge of elections. They could have made a campaign. I mean, Coca-Cola is introducing uh, 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 Coca Light, they make an advertising campaign. We change the rules of our democracy and no one, no one explain, explains what is going on. This is, this is a shame. Uh, another example, we do not um, consider that there is a space for Europeanization. The political parties still send to, to Brussels 
the same kind of people they would send to the national election. As Mario Amateo Renzi said this morning, we have the Erasmus generation right now. They are well skilled. They should be the first ones put in the list for the European elections. So we have not taken Europe seriously, and that's the reason why the, the citizens don't take it seriously. But in my opinion, it's not something that, uh, that is forever. If we would begin to look at the European election from a European point of view, we could uh, improve very quickly uh, the situation. And last point, very last point. Uh, one of the interesting elements of this campaign is that the perspective of uh, influencing the, the choice of the president of the commission has created something. For example, Marine Le Pen has refused to have a debate with Martin Schulz last month, saying he's German and these are French elections. She was ridiculous. She was criticized for that. So you start answering my question. And next, and next week, I hope there will be a debate where, uh, as far as I know, the Socialist Party says, well, we do not send a French socialist, we send uh, Martin Schulz. And I think this is great because maybe if we act like this, if the, the people in charge in our country accept the new rules, we might change. And last thing, if they want to build a group in the European Parliament, then good luck. It will be very funny to observe if they manage to find a common ground. Let's take, for example, Wilders in the Netherlands and Marine Le Pen. They say, they pretend they could build something together, but actually the first one is for free trade and she is uh, uh, completely Colbertist and, and for closed borders, etc. So we should not underestimate what we are doing. We should not overestimate their strengths. Okay. Thank is this working? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Klaus-Dieter Frankenberger, are you, are you you're, uh, the foreign editor at uh, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung? Are you sharing this view coming from France uh, or from Europe in general? Do we see similar things in, in Germany? Um, you have Martin Schulz as being one of the candidates, a very European, but also German uh, candidate to the European uh, uh, Commission's presidency. Do you see a Schulz effect? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me f first say uh, thank you very much to the organizers uh, to have me here. It's wonderful to be in, in Florence, and it's great to be on this panel. There is a Schulz effect, that's true. Uh, that's because Martin Schulz is Martin Schulz. Uh, he's a very powerful politician. He has a great uh, and, and good name recognition. He is present on the media. But I would think that's because of Martin Schulz, and, and, this, and it's not because of the innovation of this uh, being the leading candidate. He would be uh, by now on a, uh, almost daily in the news on television, even if he were not the top candidate of the European Socialists. But let me say a word in general about Germany. Germany is a mixed bag. In your introduction, you rightly pointed out that the Constitutional Court gave this verdict a few months ago about eliminating the threshold. Now, basically, every small group has a chance to be represented in Strasbourg and in Brussels. The court almost deliberately, uh, so, to, so to speak, vindicated the old assumption that the European election is the second order election, there will be 10, 11, if not 12 parties, groups represented. This is a contribution to proliferation of groups, to decentralization of groups, and in a sense are a contribution to make this somewhat ridiculous. Ridiculous in the sense that the fringe groups will be represented. Already people are warning uh, that the radical right will be represented. Now, as you know, the so-called alternative for Germany is not a radical, uh, not a radical group. They are Euro-critical, but they will be represented too, probably in good number. Uh, they will be represent represented with more than just one, one member, maybe three, four. Now, this is something new. And if the alternative for Germany is making it into the Strasbourg parliament, this will then have repercussions also for domestic politics in Germany, I'm sure. The interesting thing is actually what the CDU does, the senior government party, our party in Berlin. 
the CDU focuses almost, compl almost completely in its campaign on Angela Merkel, the Chancellor. I would dare to say on whom else. Why? The Chancellor is, and this, and in this Germany is an exception from this pervasive development in Europe that you see a decline in trust of governments. The German government more or less enjoys high approval rates, particularly high approval rates for the Chancellor. So who is on the billboards out there? Not Jean-Claude Juncker, the Christian Democrat top candidate. Angela Merkel is on, on the billboard. Uh, there's a positive European uh, appeal within the context of national politics and symbols. Campaign posters, as I said, show Angela Merkel with the slogan, together successful in Europe. What a political or non-political statement. This correspondence with the absence of a salient issue that would galvanize voters' attention. So, in my judgment, it's basically party loyalties that will matter and a certain lack of interest. Your proposition that we might see this year a rise in voter interest, a rise in voter um, participation, I'm not so sure if it will apply to Germany. But let me say, Mr. Chairman, one more thing about Europe in general. It has been said throughout this conference that there is a populist revolt out there, and I agree wholeheartedly. There is a rise in skepticism, there is a rise in cynicism, there is an almost Euro hatred at the moment. Interesting enough, in recent weeks, somewhat related to the Ukraine and Russia developments, because Mr. Putin seems to have been strong connections are to the European right. This is a very fundamental question. Our Europe seems to have faces two problems. Lack of legitimacy internally and lack of cap capabilities externally. So the new parliament needs to address these questions, particular, particularly as it comes uh, to the legitimate question. And if you allow me one more point, which I, as a citizen, not just as an observer and a journalist, find particularly worrisome. The EU Parliament, the European Parliament, is the one institution that has accumulated powers and com competences over the years. But it doesn't seem to enjoy a similar kind of public acceptance. It may be that the reverse is almost true. That in spite of an increase in competences, there may be a decline in, in acceptance by the public, i.e. legitimacy. This is something I've worried about. I don't think I make this up. I don't think I make this up. The populist revolt almost supports and vindicates this development. And here it's something, this is something we spend, need to spend much more interest and we need to focus much more how to address this dilemma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, these are interesting and important points, and the rise of populist parties, we're going to come back to that uh, a bit later on. But let me first uh, ask my colleague uh, Roberto Dalimonte uh, from the LUIS uh, what, what his take is on the importance of these elections. Some people say these are really important elections because the presidency of the European Commission will depend on that. Uh, others say it's important because the European Parliament has become so powerful. Um, but on the other hand, you have people that say, well, we don't know, maybe the council is not going to respect uh, the majority uh, in parliament, it's going to propose another uh, uh, candidate for the presidency. Or uh, maybe nothing will, will uh, change because the EU commission's presidency is not in itself really politicizing the commission. The commission will just remain a bit like the Swiss government where you have representatives of all parties in there. So how do you see this? Alex, I will answer your question, but first I want to give uh, Mr. Frank uh, Frankenberger in the audience a piece of information that um, just came out a few hours ago. Italy has decided to imitate Germany at least on one point, questioning the thresholds. Uh, today we have discovered that the Italian Constitutional Court has been asked 
due to the action of a lower court in Venice, it has been asked to rule on the constitutionality of our 4% threshold for the election to the European Parliament. I will not give here my personal opinion on that, but it's very close to what you have expressed. And uh, having said that, I go back to your question. Yes, I do believe that these are, have the potential of being the first truly European election, but not for the reason that usually is given, and that is because we are going to choose the candidate president for the commission. You know, I'm a, I'm a man of numbers, and I'm a man that works in the electoral field, most people in Italy, and I'll say most people in Europe, and when I say most, I mean very large majority, do not know this institutional change. They have no idea that they are going to vote for selecting the candidate to the presidency of the European Commission. Let me tell you that 28% of Italian voters don't even know that we're going to have elections on the May 25th for the European Parliament. Almost, you know, almost 30 percent don't even know that there is an election. I think, however, that in spite of this, because I think too much is made of this institutional change following the Treaty of Lisbon for in the short run. I think in the long run, it might have an impact, but in the short run, I don't see it as a factor that will change electoral behavior. The real factor that is going to change electoral behavior is the Euro crisis. This is what has made Europe an issue in Italy and in the other 27 states of the European Union. This is the difference with the election of 2009, the real difference. The election, the 2009 election belongs to another age. These elections are the first election after the Euro crisis, and this Euro crisis has made Europe known, has made Europe uh, aware. People have become aware that Europe matters. Before the Euro crisis, Euro crisis, the majority of the Italians, and I'll say the majority in most European countries, did not think that Europe matter, really. Today, they know that Europe matter. However, if you ask me what the effect of this awareness is on the electoral behavior of people, how people vote, I have to tell you that Campaigns, electoral campaigns, the electoral campaigns that we see are still local. This has not changed the nature of the electoral campaign. It has not changed even the selection of candidates to the European Parliament, certainly not in Italy, maybe so in some, maybe, in some European countries. This is not what has changed. But I expect that we are going to see changes first, as you have mentioned, in um, the rise of parties that are not very friendly to Europe. And we might see changes, and this is what I will look forward to seeing, on turnout. Because at the end, if we have to conclude that these elections are truly European elections, we have to see signs of changes in vo voters' participation. So, for example, I want to see if in Britain the success that is forecasted of the UKIP is going to happen with a turnout of 35 percent, as in 2009. Only 35 percent of the British people went to vote. So, it makes a difference whether the UKIP will get 30 percent with a 35 percent turnout or it will get 30% or 25% with a 40%, 40, 45% turnout. 
So I like to see those data before I answer fully your question, because if we are going to see a, an increase in turnout rates in some countries, particularly those countries where turnout has been going down, where it's, become, where it's, been, it's been traditionally low, then I can answer the question by saying the, there is a difference. There is a difference. There's been an impact. But that we have to wait for Sunday night to discover. One last point. Many people look with um, fear to the rise of populist parties. The UKIP, anti-European, Eurosceptics, the UKIP, Grillo in Italy, uh, the Sweden Democrats, the, the Front National. I don't share this view because I think to create Europe and to have significant European elections this time and in the future, we need to talk about Europe and these parties, paradoxically, help us to frame a political discourse on Europe and why Europe matters. So paradoxically, I see this not necessarily as a negative development. We have to talk about Europe and these parties are helping us to make Europe central in our political discourse. So by politicizing uh, Europe and by politicizing European elections, maybe we have indeed opened up a uh, Pandora's box, but that could have, in terms of democracy, actually quite positive outcomes. Even if we don't like the parties that get in there, or if we like them, for democracy this may be something good. Federica Mogherini, uh, you have been taken up office in uh, uh, Matteo Renzi's government very recently. And at a very difficult uh, period in time, and your portfolio is uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, relations of Italy. And uh, Bridget Laffin, in her uh, State of the Union uh, speech just before, has mentioned the return uh, of geopolitics uh, in Europe. And uh, my question is uh, to you, how does this return to geopolitics, the realization that there is not just Europe and the European Parliament and the Euro, but there is also our very close neighbors and very important uh, 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 states, such as Russia, that is uh, right now creating a bit of problems in Ukraine. How does that, do you still have time for European elections? Personally not, but also because I think that uh, it's not necessarily uh, an issue for Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and that might go to being uh, an Erasmus generation. I see the European affairs uh, as internal issues and not as foreign affairs uh, issue. I uh, think that I can be criticized by diplomats in the room, uh, but I really believe that, uh, I share very much what Roberto was saying before, and here you, I give you the news that you can have two Italians on a panel agreeing on something, <laughs> uh, that it's basically the, Euro the economic crisis that has made uh, our people realize that Europe matters, that what is decided in Brussels, and I say in Brussels and not by Brussels, uh, counts on our internal issues, starting from economy. Uh, and so I think that to go back to the big question, uh, these elections could potentially be the first European elections in terms of awareness of the electorate uh, that sending someone to the European Parliament or sending a minister to European Council uh, is not uh, uh, giving away sovereignty but is a way of uh, gaining back sovereignty because the minimum level where you can take decisions that count and affect uh, in this world on your own lives, on your own internal politics, policies is actually the minimum level of Europe. Uh, still, I am afraid that we could miss this uh, potential uh, during this campaign. Uh, I think that, uh, well, I'm quite excited to see the first uh, debate that will be uh, in Italy among candidates uh, following our panel uh, later on. I am very excited, having grown up as a federalist, by the fact that there are alternative candidates uh, to, uh, of the political families. I think that is extremely important. Still, 
I see the campaign too much on national issues. Uh, I see uh, we are missing a chance when we fail to explain that Martin Schulz is first of all a socialist and then a German, and that I refuse, as an Italian, as a minister, as whatever, to put the issue in a matter of national confrontation. And here we have to recognize that we have a political responsibility in the past. Um, I tend not to use the word populism or even Eurosceptical because I think that, uh, I think Matteo Renzi was mentioning today the spread between expectations and, and answers and, and deliverables of the European Union. I think that is the gap where uh, populism grows. It's a disillusion of our people and it's the exact uh, and obvious uh, outcome of 10 years, at least 10 years, of political choices that have played the blame game. So it's not us going to Brussels taking decisions for ourselves, but it's Brussels deciding something on our shoulders. This has generated a system where Brussels became blocked. I do not believe Brussels is, is a solution. This has been the discourse of many of our governments, national governments. So I don't invest in the European level. So the European level doesn't function. So the European level doesn't deliver. And so the prophecy becomes true. What we see today, the race of populism, what, what we call it the race of populism, is just the natural outcome of 10 years of political choices. So I think that the potential of these elections is to try and reinverse this trend, saying, look, it's not a referendum in favor or against Europe. It's a choice on what kind of political choices you're going to have in Brussels by people that have different political, uh, different political views. Um, but I don't want to skip your question about Russia. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to, keep, uh, to, to have the chance as the others to, to, to answer to the European one. Um, obviously, part of the, of the limitations that this lack of investment on the European level has had uh, has been on the European capacity to have global responses and even regional responses. We were talking before entering here briefly about the fact that probably uh, if European Union had uh, a more coordinated and, and, and a visionary approach to the Ukrainian crisis before the crisis started, uh, we would be in a better condition now. Uh, Russia is a neighboring country, is a partner country, not only for European Union, but also for NATO till one month ago, uh, is a suspended member of the G8 at the moment, still is a member of the G8, still is a partner for us, and I think that if we manage to come out of these European elections of the new phase of transition at the institutional level in a smooth way, in a, in a reasonable way, it would be good to understand also the way in which the European Union manages to develop its foreign policy. I think the added value we have um, is seeing relations in the world in terms of cooperation instead of confrontation. That is our strength. That is also the historical roots of, of Europe. Uh, the project started uh, uh, by creating uh, friends and neighbors instead of people that were fighting each other. And uh, that is our added value. I think that even with the current crisis around Ukraine, the added value that the European Union can play, can give to the international process is to try and find the way of recreating the conditions for Ukraine, for instance, to uh, have good and normal relations to all of, our, of its neighbors, as it is for all European Union countries. Um, difficult? Definitely difficult. Uh, is the European Union necessarily the, uh, the forum where this is possible? Maybe at this stage not. Could be. And, and, for, the, and for the, if I may follow up on this, for sure. the elections itself, in the campaign, I. By, by looking at uh, what is published in newspapers, one has the pages on the Ukraine and one has the pages on the European elections. But they are suspiciously independent. And if you look at the positions taken, but we will see tonight, maybe Ukraine will be an important issue after all. But so far it has not been really tainting 
uh, in my view, the uh, election campaign. Would you see this as well? You're absolutely right. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. You're absolutely right. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, while you have seen the reactions in Europe on a national basis, which is exactly the trap we are falling in every time. Uh, that's why I say we have a big potential in front of us with the European elections. If we manage, but not only the people that are going to vote, also the political parties, especially the European parties, the groups in the European Parliament, we manage to get out of this national puzzle that puts us one side to the other, but still with national positions, and we get to political European positions. I think the different two pages in the newspapers is because probably there is no still a clear division or a clear vision uh, in terms of political standing on the uh, European foreign policy. Uh, and that is a problem. There might be different visions on the need for having a European foreign and defense policy, by the way. Uh, but uh, that would be interesting to see tonight, I think. Uh, it's a good suggestion to ask uh, the moderators to ask uh, the candidates what is their view on Ukraine. And uh, I hope their view will not be uh, reflecting too much the national positions, but rather their party positions. Uh, very good. Uh, I would like to come back uh, a minute to, uh, to the effect of or the foreseeable uh, uh, success of populist, uh, sometimes populist right-wing, but not just right-wing, uh, anti-European, but not just anti-European, but parties that are not part of this conglomerate that has been running the parliament so far. Um, uh, and maybe, maybe Miguel, uh, you could give me your view. What, what if 25% of the European Parliament will be in the hands of, uh, will be occupied by anti-European, Europe opposing parties. Would there have to be a commissioner from one of these parties, for example, in the future commission that is against Europe? Or does that not matter at all? Because after all, it remains a minority and we still have a very solid uh, majority of pro-Europeans. What is your take? You have similar problems in some national parliaments where radical parties have strong position. There's nothing different in Europe. Uh, is it desirable? Would I prefer the electoral, electorate not to choose populist or radical parties? Yes. Uh, but if they are chosen, uh, they will be represented in the parliament and we have to deal with it. Um, I believe that the, the impact that may have is uh, with respect to what kind of majorities will be formed in Parliament. And it might, uh, to a certain extent, decrease the likelihood of something that you were saying, that is the a stronger left-right divide uh, within the mainstream parties. Because you, this may be a force pulling the mainstream parties to find a consensus to be opposed to radical parties to anti-European parties. Um, again, I would prefer the debates in the European Parliament and the positions in the European Parliament to be more about different political projects for Europe than the debates being about being for or against Europe. Um, but if that will be the reality in Parliament, we will have to deal with it. That's as simply as that. Sylvie Goula wanted to comment on this. Maybe I'm too optimistic. I'm not saying it's not going to change. Of course, we will respect the results of the election. But come on, if you have 25% of extremists, you have 75% of the people who are not, okay? Let's try to focus on the ones who are not extremists. And uh, if you look at what we did in the last five years, uh, first of all, the extremists are very lazy, okay? They don't work. <laughs> They just go to the European Parliament to take the money and that's it. Okay, if they want to work, then it will be a change and uh, we will have a look at this. But Marine Le Pen, his father and many, her father and many people did not make a report, did not make an amendment. Let's, let's say it loudly, okay? They are lazy. The second thing is that if you look at the way we adopted the text, and this is one of the positive aspects of this Parliament, we are very often building majorities, which does not mean that we are all on the same line at the beginning. I mean, we have our own positions, 
we produce amendments, and then we try to find a compromise. And in my opinion, we should explain more that this is something positive. And my very last remark, we have a grande coalition, a grosse coalition in Germany. We have a, a coalition in, in Italy. We have even a coalition in the UK. And you are explaining us that the way the European Parliament functions with compromises between the moderate would be something that is not good. Come on. In France, we don't have a coalition, and we see how easy it is to make reforms. So let's try to be positive and to rely on the people who want to work and to be constructive. And if we have 75%, don't worry, we will work. But would you, would you prefer these anti-European populist parties or members of these parties to, instead of being lazy, to become hyperactive? Well, I'm, we are now campaigning. And I want the people who give their vote to someone who said expressly, I'm not going to be in a commission, I'm not going to work, that the citizen appreciate as taxpayer. Then we will see the day after the election how, what they do. Federica wanted to take the floor. Yes. Uh, to, can you hear me? Yes. To uh, say that in the Italian experience, which is quite large with, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, anti uh, whatever movement and parties, um, I would like to give an advice. Don't call them uh, extremists or uh, anti-Europeans. They are anti-system movements. Being the system national, local, European, if they, would, if, if they were to be in the United Nations, they would be against the United It's an anti-system approach, which obviously products nothing. Because if you work in the system and you're anti-system, it doesn't produce anything at all. I think that it's not a matter of being lazy. I'm not, I'm not defending them. Uh, in the Italian parliament, for instance, the Grillo movement is extremely present, extremely active, but they don't produce anything in any case because the, the way the institutions work, and especially the European institutions work, is that you have to find some sort of relation with the others. You have to get out of your small little identity. And that is the sense of the European policies or the European way of doing politics and institutions, that you have to cross the border of your own little identity and meet the others and work together with the others. In my point of view, it's better to find a clear definition. I agree with, uh, with my uh, colleague. Uh, it would be better to get out of this pro-European, anti-European uh, approach and get more on a, on, on a left and right approach. But still, the confrontation is cross-border in terms of nationality, in terms of identity. Uh, obviously, they don't produce anything because I will be very curious about seeing how their political groups in Parliament would work. I think they would simply not function or even exist because the sense of the European uh, uh, political life is, uh, is much bigger than just being anti-system at the European level. I, th I, I, don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mm, concentrate on this pro-European, anti-European. I would say there's an anti-system movement across the borders, but then on the 75% that stays out of this anti-system movement, the ones that are ready to work in the system, even sometimes to change the system, because we know the limits of the system, then there, there are different options. And we're going to confront these options tonight. Uh, it's a little bit complex, but I think we have to start to tell the truth to our people uh, yes. in order for them to behave uh, as responsible and aware citizens. And I think, I think you have just been uh, raising a very important point, is uh, that these 25% and even the 75%, of course, this we know, but the 25% are not very homogenous as a group at all. And we see this in the great difficulty that they have to probably uh, form or possibly form a political group. It could be that these 25% are not able at all to create a political group and therefore they can remain lazy because without a political group, your influence in the European Parliament is minimal. Uh, Klaus Dieter, you wanted to come in on this. This is true, and I agree very, very much with what the foreign minister said, but still 25% is 25%, that's a big number. Imagine for an experiment purpose that in the UK, the UK, the UK party comes ahead. Imagine for experiment purpose that in France, Front National comes ahead as a relatively strongest party, that Wilders in the Netherlands comes ahead of the, as the strongest party. Let's assume that this was the case uh, just for an experiment. Do we think 
then politics as normal would continue? No, no way. And for most on the national level, I would be pleasantly surprised if it didn't have a negative effect on the whole national debate, for example, on immigration. But I would think it will poison the domestic debate even further. You, you uh, Mr. Professor, said, suggested, well, this may have a positive repercussion, you know, a wake-up call for the, the pro-Europe, the integrationist groups. Yes, it may be, this may be true, but my gut feeling would be it would poison the politics in Paris, in London, somewhere in, in the Netherlands, in Finland, in Sweden, from day on, Monday, 26. That's my gut. We should, I guess we should not fool ourselves in a way. This anti-establishment movement, this populist revolt out there, is related and impacted upon by the crisis. But I would think there are also much deeper forces at work in our societies that are hard to understand. I mean, Mario Monte this morning had a, had a hunch on when he said, well, there's a backlash against globalization. We have in German the word Heimat, you know, where you belong to, your traditional way of life. And a lot of people feel threatened by, the, by this wind of change that are blowing heavily from east and west and north and south. And this makes people frightened. So uh, to sum it up, if the UKIP in London, uh, the UKIP in the, in the United Kingdom, anti-European, anti-establishment, anti-elite, comes ahead of all the others, and this will not have an effect, I would be very much surprised. Yes. Ro Ro Roberto, uh, very briefly on this point, and then Miguel. Yeah, what, uh, I mean, obviously it's an interesting point, but we are talking about what kind of effect will be I know. in Europe. I know. You're absolutely right, it will have an effect on national politics. But what kind of effect will it have at the level of European politics? But there's another thing that might be interesting, because this anti-establishment or anti-Europe, uh, we really don't know, in my opinion, really well what is the real driver in different countries of this attitude. Let me give you a piece of information which I was very surprised to find out. Today, I published in my newspaper a survey. There is a question that uh, we asked. Uh, which factor do you believe is most responsible for the economic crisis? And the items that were offered to the respondents were the euro, the banks, the national debt, the business community, the political class. 40% of the respondents chose the political class, not the euro. Only 90% answered that the most important factor to explain the, the economic crisis was the euro. Even the banks did better than the political class. So I wonder the answer to the same question in France or in Britain, because you mentioned the UKIP. But there are some national factors. That's why I say Italy. Why is this answer in Italy? Because they are national factors, the different context. Uh, and, and context matter. I also like to say something about you know 25%. The thing is that these 25% they are divided. Because again, these national factors are very uh, great importance. Uh, Marine Le Pen is one thing. Uh, Farage and, uh, is another thing. And uh, uh, the Sweden Democrats and other things, the two Finns stand for other things. You know, they, they're all different. And, and, and we will uh, have to find a boss. We will have to find a boss, which is very funny because yeah. they are completely nationalistic and they will have to find the president of the group yeah. and to choose someone coming from one country, they which can't. for us is not a problem. For them, it might be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. So they, they're all divided. They stand for, they stand for something that look similar, but they are really very different among themselves. Which so, also, which also yeah. means that probably on the 26th of uh, May, we don't know anything just yet. We'll have to wait for quite some time until we find out <coughs> who won these elections, how it's going to work out, who is going to be able to form a group or not in the European Parliament. Miguel. I, I want to say that we are focusing too much on 
the risk for, that these groups and parties represent on themselves. And to be honest, I'm more concerned with the risk that mainstream parties may increasingly borrow arguments that's, that's, that's from these radical parties in order to avoid them their progression in electoral terms. And I think we are seeing this. Yeah. And this is for me a reason of much more concern. That they will win, not because they will win in themselves, because they will win because they will conquer part of the political arguments used by mainstream parties. And I think this requires a great responsibility for political for mainstream political parties, but it also requires for Europe to be able to offer something more than simply discipline. And as I said, and I am part of a government that applied very tough measures, complied with the rules, and that's why I also feel that we have enough credibility to say that, that Europe needs to be able to offer something else. If Europe is perceived by national citizens, by European citizens, only as a source of rules, only as a source of discipline, then it cannot provide hope to them. And the only way... It, the, populism grows when the, the situation is bad, the reality is bad, and there is no margin for people to hope. Then why shouldn't you turn to someone that comes up with an illusion anyway? The reality... You offer nothing within reality that provides hope to people, they turn to something else. Right. In but in order for Europe to be able to develop a program, policies, something that offers to European citizens something else than simply discipline and rules and limits and what they cannot do, then you need to have Europe with a stronger muscle. A stronger political muscle, a stronger, a stronger financial muscle. And I think we need to uh, really recognize that. Yes, that's also what, what polls actually uh, often show. Citizens are, are pretty much aware that most of these large problems can only be solved at the European level, just not necessarily within the European institutions. So they distrust the institutions, they distrust the parliament, they distrust the, the commission, etc. But they still believe that the problems need some kind of coordination at the supranational level to be, to be solved. Federica, you've, Though, you've the, Let me that. just say something, just to inter actually, Traditionally, trust in European institutions is nevertheless higher, higher. than yeah. trust in national yes, institutions. Yes, but we're, we're getting to a Delaware effect, a race to the bottom here. So, <laughs> Federica. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say that in the end, Sylvie will be very disappointed because in the end we spent most of our time discussing of Marine Le Pen and others similar. And I think this is a mistake uh, because the real answer, the only answer uh, we can really give is recognizing the request for answers at the European level uh, and, and giving responses to this need of change delivering, uh, which is a word that is very American and very little European, and I think this is a problem. Uh, I think that if we manage to use this next European elections, because we normally see the potential of the European elections in terms of uh, the behavior of the voters, we never think of the potential for us to use the European elections to change the, the, the wave uh, of European politics. Uh, if we use the European elections, the beginning of the new uh, mandate in, Parliament, in the European Parliament, the beginning of a new commission of the Council, to give an impression, an impression not in the sense of a sense, but a, a real uh, start so of a new phase in European politics, that will be getting the potential of these maybe real European elections, saying, listen, you know what? We understood there is a problem. There is a problem in the way in which European institutions have missed the opportunity to deliver, has missed the opportunity to respond properly to Europe, the economic crisis, has missed the opportunity to give you a dream or a sense of identity, a common identity. We understood it. Now you have different choices. Who wins? Try to govern and to give a political answer mm. with a political line. Is, 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 do I see here also a little bit of sense? If you look at, for example, the campaign budgets by the parties, if you look at the German uh, parties, they invest just about half of what they have invested into the European campaign and what they have invested into the last uh, uh, Bundestagswahl campaign. So 
I think you're very right. We should also, or at least politicians, uh, should insist more on these European elections if they want to make these really European elections that matter. Yes, and, and most of all, uh, not only a matter of how much money we invest in the campaign, we know very well that the real campaign is in the years that precede the campaign, is in your behavior, is in the consistency of your behavior. Uh, I think that the real change uh, of attitude by the governments, by the political forces, would be, and that would be a game changer, doing what you say once you're in Brussels, and once you're in Rome or in, in Lisbon or in Paris, uh, saying what you've done in Brussels. Uh, it seems extremely simple, I think, but it's just what none of our governments so far has really been doing. Sylvie Goulard. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm never disappointed when I come to Italy and to Firenze. First of all, because we have heard not only a speech, but even your, your position that is much more pro-European than everything I hear in Paris. So I wanted to ask you something. <laughs> I make I a suggestion. I, I make a suggestion. You are going to have the presidency. You have the opportunity, first of all, to help us to find the good, the good ones to lead. This is a huge challenge because the institutions are fine, but if you don't have the right persons, we have been spending 10 years with the same, change them and find the good ones. This is the first task of the Italian presidency. The second one, if I may, might be to to make an assessment on after the election. Why don't you invite some people and say, well, let's look at why is the, the turnout so low? What did we miss? You take people from, from the press, from the television, from the European Parliament, from the Commission. What do we have to change? Not only in the communication, and, and you said this, it's more a matter of a code of conduct, or what, what is the, the, at least the, the minimal change in the behavior we really have to implement in the next five years in order to make sure that we are not going to be in the same situation or even in a worse situation in five years. Because you said it was already clear in 2009. I can tell you when I wrote my first book on the Turkish accession, it was on the basis of the turnout of the election 2004. It was already declining very rapidly, the turnout. So please, you who will be in charge, do something in the, last, in the next six months, a kind of assessment for relaunching something that works better. Deal. Okay. Okay, very good. I was told that I have to respect the time uh, meticulously, but I would still like to uh, ask for one question from the floor, if that is, uh, if that is wanted, desired. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question to one of our panelists? In the back, I see the gentleman in the white shirt. And could you else. please tell us who you are? Alex, there was someone else. You should, should I'm Fabio Mazzini. I'm Secretary General of the European Movement in Italy. Um, the people, the citizens, European citizens, are being told that they are going to vote for the president of the next European Commission. Are you both ministers ready to commit yourself and your government uh, to the fact that uh, the next president of the European Commission will be selected among uh, the candidates and not in a compromise within the Council? Thank you. I can answer the position of the Portuguese government because we made it clear. Go ahead. The position of the Portuguese government is that we believe that whoever will be the candidate supported by the political group with most votes in parliaments should have the first chance to try to form a commission and become president. It doesn't mean if the parliament, as in national parliaments, doesn't reach an agreement, then we might go into different solutions. But whoever will be the candidate supported by the political group with most votes, with most members in the European Parliament, should have that first opportunity to do it. Agree. Very I good. Ag I agree. Uh, I think that, uh, well, uh, after all we'll say it, uh, it's impossible to say, uh, no, we have to find a compromise in the Council, obviously. Uh, do you hear me? No. Yes? Okay. Yes, no, uh, if we say that we have to politicize uh, the choices, uh, then we have to respect the will of the voters. Uh, so, for sure. Uh, then we feel an additional responsibility, being the next presidency, of assuring that we don't spend the next six months fighting among institutions, within the institutions, because then 
not even after the end of the mandate, but after a couple of months, people will come to Brussels and <laughs> then, then we don't even talk about populism, then we talk about revolution, I think. So uh, we, we, nationally, we share completely that point of view. Then I think that if that, that doesn't work, or if political families don't stick, because that could also be an issue, and I think we should ask to the candidates today to bring back home to their, nation, to their political families the commitment to stick to that. If that doesn't work for different reasons, because the European Parliament doesn't find uh, a real agreement or something, then we know that as an Italian presidency, we have to assure that the transition at the institutional level is smooth and the institutions are ready to function as soon as possible and in the most efficient way as possible, because we cannot spend six months fighting among each other because we don't know who does what. This is something that will not be uh, sustainable. Okay, I think we will have to cut it here. This is a very nice transition towards a major event in European politics at this, uh, at this time. Here in Florence, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the discussion, the debate among the candidates to the presidency of the European um, Commission. Uh, we're all very much looking forward to that, and I would like to thank the panelists here uh, for a, a very interesting and dynamic uh, um, panel here. Thank you. Thank you.